Hey, welcome to episode 112 of Tangible Takeaways. 112. 112. Wow. I'm here with Tanner Amaral, who is not our guest today. Not the guest. Um, but a guest. here, uh, you would recognize Tanner if you came and hung out with us on Tangible Takeaways episode 100, where 100. we revealed Tanner. Wow. Tanner has been making Tangible Takeaways happen since its very beginning. Wow. Episode 1 to episode 112, many of them mm. have happened without me. That's None true. of them have happened without I've you. I've been here for every episode. Is that a true statement? That is yeah, a true statement. It's a true wow. statement. Yeah. So wow. you've been here for every single one. Every single one. But that being said, episode 113, you will not be here I for. I won't be here for episode 113. And why is that? Tell the good people of Tangible Takeaways what you did. All you tangible takers. Yeah. There. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, so I won't be here for 113 because I'm going to be starting my new job at Mount Hermon up in the Santa Cruz Mountains. Boo and I yay know, all at the I same know. time. Yeah, super exciting times. So they uh, they need a video guy and I'm that I'm that guy, so off I go. And what are you going to be doing specifically video related there? Yeah, I'll be their video media manager. So on a day-to-day non-summer like time, I'll be doing everything marketing video-wise for the marketing team up there. And then come summertime, we're bringing in summer staffers who mm-hmm. are, you know, making all the video recaps happen and so I'll be their manager and checking in on them and seeing them grow throughout the summer. And yeah, that'd be really exciting. Looking yeah. forward to it. Yeah. Big change. Yeah. Big change. Big change. You and Carissa are both big outdoorsy people though. So we that's going to be a lot of fun. Yeah. We uh, timed it. It's about 20 minutes from our driveway to the beach. So that's pretty cool. Not too bad. We like that. And you're in the mountains. And so that's in fun. The mountains. Yeah. So so the whole California thing just built in right there. That is the one spot right there. Yeah. You really want it. Yeah, yeah. that's pretty cool. And uh, obviously great fit for your skill set, which we've benefited from so much here at HDC and uh, great opportunities for you to be able to lead and um, lead that team. I'm super excited to see what you do with that crew. Um, and uh, just so thankful for you. Um, the people of Tangible Takeaways and the people of HDC might not know or appreciate all of the things that you do, but they will know very, very quickly uh, in the wake of um, you being gone. And they'll be like, wow, uh, things things suck video-wise. And they'll be like, oh yeah, that's because Tanner's not here. So it will be a slow fall off. I've got a few things backloaded for yeah, everyone. So. Yeah, that's good. That's good. You've, you've, you've caught us up a little bit. Yeah. But um, man, just so thankful for you. And um, if you've really appreciated or enjoyed uh, anything from Tangible Takeaways, would love um, just any gratitude or appreciation you could throw in the comments there for Tanner. Um, because we're so thankful for him. Um, and obviously because of this, we're gonna be taking a little bit of a hiatus from Tangible Takeaways. We kinda, it's like a little bit of like, a, we don't totally know, um, but yeah. hopefully we'll be back up and running. We're working on some solutions and we'll be back up and running here soon. Mm. But uh, wanted to let you know about that change coming our way. Wanted to also give you an opportunity to hear what Tanner's up to, uh, to be excited for him. But that being said, gear up, get excited, mm. get ready for oh. uh, the last tangible takeaways for some undisclosed amount of time. Just I really can't give you a time, maybe less. Yeah, I'm, I don't think I'm saying the last tangible takeaways. No. I think I'm just saying the last tangible takeaways for a certain period of time. Just a little bit. Yeah. And we went all out. We got Mike and Mikey and myself on. So we've it's got- true. There's three people at this table. Three people going. It's tight. Yeah. So- mm. Mm. Well, thank you very much for yes. all of your effort and energy and the tangible takeaways. It's been my here. pleasure. I'll it's let you throw time. it to the episode. Wow. And now I've forgotten the phrase you say <laughs> every week. <laughs> uh, all that and more on this episode of Tangible Takeaways. Boom. <laughs> <laughs> I'm so crap. What do you say? <laughs> Hey, welcome to Tangible Takeaways, episode 112. I'm here with Mikey and Mike, and the three of us were teaching this weekend. So Uh, we got three people on Tangible Takeaways, and I think we all talked sufficiently this weekend. So Mm. we'll aim for a a shorter Tangible Takeaways here. (laughs) Good idea. Yeah, 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 we've we've talked to plenty. Um, But uh, man, I really... um, 
a really challenging passage this weekend. We were talking on camera and it's just honestly been in our kind of different meetings um, as a ministry staff over the last few weeks has just been an ongoing conversation for us Mm -hmm. on the Mm -hmm. ministry side of things of just like how challenging the messages have been, how good that's been, the conversations we've been having with people. And uh, I'm hoping that our church family, even as they're listening to this or feeling encouraged after the last three weeks, lots of like kind of tension filled points, but Mm -hmm. very encouraged to be walking through these things and earnestly seeking after what God's word says, because we don't want to be ignorant about that. So um, thankful for it. I don't know about you guys. I really actually enjoyed the study process because it was such a tricky passage. It was, there was so much to dig into. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. And the fact that we three come together with an agreement on on the points that we want our people to walk away with. Uh, And one of the distinctions was the fact that if each of us had to preach our own message, I don't think we'd have the same takeaways. Yeah. yeah. Um, So what was unique was the fact that when when I was teaching points that we were assigned, uh, I knew it came from you or I knew it came from you. And um, the fact that we get to to, to do this collaboratively uh, probably means a lot more for our people, mm. you know? Uh, and it does make us study that much more because, you know, we come at this with our own perspective in, in our own things. However, when it's a collaborative effort um, for the goal of our people taking more from this, um, that's what makes it worth it. Yeah, it was good. Yeah, yeah. it was interesting because, uh, you know, I'm, every time I, I preach, there's an inner dialogue, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're having a kind of a conversation with yourself and Mm -hmm. sometimes you're trying to turn it down. Yeah. And I felt like this time it was like, dang, that's loud. Yeah. My inner, my inner conversation. Don't say that. Don't say that. Oh man. It was just really challenging because, you know, I'm kind of fighting that the whole time I'm working my way through Mm. that, you know, just like, oh, did you explain that right? Or, Mm, oh, maybe, you know, you should have said it that way. And I'm like, no, stop that. And it, it, this was really, this was really a challenging thing because the, the weight of the significance of how people are living um, some of the things that we're addressing in yeah. this passage, I mean, it's, it's weighty, it's significant, oh, yeah. you know, it has, it's a high impact area of life. And so, man, I just, I was, I was talking to myself <laughs> yeah. while I'm trying to talk to <laughs> everybody else. So it was, it was, uh, it was quite the challenge. Yeah. But. Yeah. It is interesting when you're in one of those passages that you know is going to be really tension filled. Mm-hmm. You really want to be faithful to mm-hmm. what the text says. And mm-hmm. so your inner dialogue saying that. But then, you know, you're just looking out at a group of people who aren't even trying to react in any way, shape, or form to mm-hmm. you. They're just listening. But yeah. you see somebody turn their head away sharply or something, and you're like, oh, my gosh. Oh, like, man. I just I just offended somebody. You know, honestly, <laughs> yeah. you're like in your head. You're just yeah. trying to work through all of this. And like, but I want to be faithful, but I don't want to just cause uh, unnecessary pain and right, hurt. Yeah. And so you're trying to walk that line. Yeah. Um, and it's been challenging. I can only imagine what my dad's been going through for the last couple of weeks too. Yeah, it's just right. been three very challenging weeks. Yeah. I think it tones down a little bit this week. So, uh, right. that'll be nice. But, um, let's just talk about as we dug into first Peter chapter three verses one through seven, what was for you in studying the text is kind of, you know, almost unique perspective for us as a church where we had three people studying the text this week. What uh, for you was kind of one of the most challenging things in your study of the text? Hmm. I, I think one, I mean, just off the bat, one of the, one of the most challenging things was um, allowing this text to transcend cultural context mm. while including the understanding of the cultural context that this this letter was written originally Mm -hmm. because the first century church was dealing with a lot and i still think today that the church is dealing with a lot so allowing this timeless document to apply to right now um, but also shoot straight through those stigmas uh, of 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 a culture in a society right now that that is not for what masculinity looks like in a church uninformed Mm. right Uh, so when it says like wives of unbelieving husbands you know and it it addresses this thing these things i think obviously the apostle peter's writing the church of the first century and it's very valid because he understood why there were so many wives of unbelieving husbands but today if we look in our church if we look in the church at all it's all too common as well now Mm. so allowing this document to transcend the cultural context but also apply directly to us it was very challenging to to not um, to not side skirt the confrontation that a text like this can bring, 
you yeah. know. Um, but along with that, again, like you said, having that confidence in the fact that we want to be faithful to the text. We want to be faithful to the word and, and not um, mishandle it in any way. We want to just be transparent and allow, and allow the Holy Spirit to, to land on the, the hearts of the people, mm-hmm. the words that are being delivered. So it was, it was, it was challenging all in all. We had talked about it earlier this week, but did either of you guys have people in the room raise their hand if they had been led to the Lord or gotten serious about their faith because of their relationship to their wife? I I did not do that. No. Did you? I think that if any of us would have had an opportunity, I think I would have, and I didn't. (laughs) Just because I did it at Apple Valley. Did you? Yeah, I did. It was cool. There was probably about seven to eight in both services. Yeah. Wow. You had someone come up after that kind of had that same experience, Mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. Yeah. You're telling me. Yeah, man. I mean, it's just wild. You you know it in these pastoral counseling settings, just how often you're sitting down with a guy and it's like, I'm just getting serious about this, honestly, because of my wife. Yeah. Like, it's just, yeah. it's just really interesting. It comes up yeah. all the time. And I don't know yeah. if it's like an HDC thing. It's something about the demographic of our area. Sure. But it comes up all the time. Yep. So yeah. when you get to a passage like this, you're like, bro, this is real. Yeah. Like, I, we see this it's all the really time as pastors. <laughs> this is a real thing. Yep. Yeah, 28 years of ministry, I've seen it over and over and over in three very different cultural contexts. Yeah. Mm. You know, man. Yeah, it's it's incredible. I, I would say, you know, for me, the 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 challenge, uh, kind of related to what Mikey was saying, but even just the, um, I usually don't struggle with translations mm. <laughs> as much as like this one was just there was, you know, just whether it was looking you know at that word adorn or you know the idea of you know great worth and um, you know some of those things, but. Um, uh, it, it just, <laughs> the whole passage, I just, there was just so much nuance, even in the individual words. And so I just found myself doing all these like word studies mm, and just mm. trying to get into the mind of Peter yeah. and like, why, why did you pick that word in mm. Greek? And then really what, what really is the best English way to communicate that, that word? And so, you know, you're doing that and that was all in the background. And then, you know, you don't have time to <laughs> get into all to do them. a word study in yeah. the sermon per se, but, you know, just wanted to make sure you're really communicating, you know, Peter's intent. He had a very, he had a very definite intention and the Holy Spirit had a very definite um, way that he was speaking mm. through Peter, and you just yeah. want to be faithful to that. So, yeah, it was just, um, yeah, loads of tension mm. in mm. inside me, yeah, to make sure that I'm I'm rightly dividing the word of truth. Yeah, because yeah. there's a lot of nuance to a lot of those words in there, so and then there's some that you're just like really confused because you know we use the niv here and you're just confused why the niv picked the word that they picked right, like yeah. like respect in verse seven is like mm-hmm. the, the most egregious one to me in the yeah. whole passage oh, yeah, it just that one was, mm. does not even make sense for the way that the word is translated like 99.9 percent of the time yeah mm-hmm. and so um those things so interesting just how much nuance there was in right. the passage I, I thought for me, it was really challenging um, to not, I think you naturally, when you, if you just come into First Peter 3, 1 through 7, you just want to go, great, household code. Like you just, you want to jump into that zone. Yeah. And Paul writes plenty of household codes, uh-huh. but this is so, so different mm-hmm. than household codes because really Peter's got this evangelistic intent that he's been working at through all of chapter two mm-hmm. that the way you respond to governing authorities shouldn't be primarily based on how worthy they are, but based on you wanting to bring honor and glory to the name of Jesus. The way you respond to a master shouldn't be based on how fair or harsh they are, but ultimately wanting to bring glory to Jesus. The way you respond to a husband shouldn't ultimately be based on whether believer, unbeliever, harsh or fair, but based on bringing glory to the name of Jesus. And so, the intention behind it is so different. So I want to be, you know, coming into the message, it's this tension of, man, I really want to be faithful to talk about the true roles that are being laid out in marriage. Yeah. But also Peter's not really concerned as much with the roles mm-hmm. as much as he is with the attitudes that we are bringing to these relational contexts of our life as citizens, as employees, as husband and wife. Yeah. 
the attitude that we're bringing that our lives are not our own anymore, yeah. mm. that we don't live for us, we live for Jesus. Mm. And that should bleed into all of these elements of our life. So mm. being able to talk about the stuff that still needed to be talked about, like, yeah, he did say wives submit to your husbands, and he did say that husbands are to lead their wives. So that was there. Yeah. But that's really, at the end of the day, not really what he's talking about. He's talking about yep. the attitudes and the disposition that you yep. bring to all of your relationships because of how transformational your relationship is to Jesus. Yeah. And so being able to still say, but that's this is really what we're talking about. We're just talking about it in the context of marriage now. Yeah. That yeah. was a yeah. difficult tension to yeah, ride. It was, for sure. Um, I, I also thought that the as we look at some kind of elements of the passage, I thought it was so interesting the um, talking about word studies and stuff like that, Mike, the elements of a gentle and quiet spirit. Mm -hmm. um, those two words so interesting to me as we dug into them uh, in our study. And I think if I were just reading this devotionally and I wasn't putting all this time and effort and energy, I'd be like, Oh, that's a, that is what godly women are like yeah. is they're gentle and they have quiet spirits. That would be kind of like a just devotional thought that would pop into my head. Yeah. Yeah. But the way that those words are used, particularly gentle is just used of Jesus and Jesus followers. And this is really, it's specified to the wife here, but it's really a word and a concept that's not specified to wives who are believers, but to everybody who's a, a believer. believer. Yep, yeah. And so as we talk about having a gentle and a quiet spirit, that sounds so different than probably most people in America's experience of Christians today. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I don't know how many people in America would say like, oh yeah, I know a couple of Christians. Man, they are super gentle. <laughs> and they definitely are not concerned about things. They just have this very like quiet, present spirit about them. Yeah. I, don't, I don't know, <laughs> I, I don't hear that a yeah, lot. Yeah. So as we are people who <clears throat> want to adorn or what we said in our notes, we want to invest in what Jesus finds beauty in. We yeah. want to center our lives on the things that Jesus says is, are important. How do we become people of greater gentleness or quiet spirits? Hmm. It was funny. Um, I recalled a book that I read um, probably within the first 10 years of being a pastor that was written during a particularly contentious political season mm. and the book was called sinners in the hands of an angry <clears throat> church mm. and it was a call to the church of america to um to stop politicizing mm. um everything <laughs> christian mm -hmm. and uh, and live winsome um gentle quiet Christ-like lives, you know, um, yeah. as opposed to <laughs> just being so harsh uh, toward those who don't believe. Um, and so it was, it was interesting. I kind of, I kind of went back to that, pulled that book off, off the shelf and kind of flipped through it looking for mm. some things. And it was just kind of an interesting reminder, but yeah, I, um, for me, the the verse, and I didn't talk about this at all in the sermon, but the verse that that comes to my mind is is the the one that James says uh, early on when he says, um, "Let every one of you be quick to hear, slow mm. to speak, mm. slow to anger." <clears throat> and um, I, I find that um, that that the gentle, quiet spirit that I'm after, um, that I hope is growing in me as a Christ follower. Um, it just, it, it, I, I do so much better when my desire is to hear and not speak. Mm, yeah, and yeah. Uh, I can be, I can, at least again in my home with my wife. Um, usually, when we have the most trouble, it's because I want her to listen to me mm -hmm. because I know I'm right, and if she would just listen to me, sure, yeah. then she yeah. could be and right surely too. Surely she'd understand. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> right. And it's amazing that when I just close my mouth and mm -hmm. open my ears, because mm -hmm. God gave me one of those and two of the other, yeah. and I really, I just say, I, I just want to understand my wife's perspective. It's, it's amazing what I learn mm -hmm. and, uh, and how, oh, yeah, I, I, I was off. Mm -hmm. I was 
I was in error. And so, um, yeah, that's that was kind of what came to my mind, just personally, yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. as I began to think about how how does this apply to Mike? <laughs> so yeah. that's good. Yeah, no, I agree with that. You know, one of the one of the best parts about that passage in James that you just talked about, Mike, is the fact that when Scripture is is um, so clear and succinct at times, when when it says what to do and it says why to do it, yeah, right. So James one eighteen says, "Dear brothers and sisters, be quick to listen." So to speak, and so to become angry. The following verse says, yeah. <laughs> "Because ang- man's anger doesn't bring about the righteous life that God desires." Yeah. And when it's when it's one plus two <laughs> equals three, <laughs> yeah. it's very simple. Yeah, it's but when simple. when the apostle Peter writes chapter two and tells us who we are, mm. and then and then through chapter two tells us who we are in these contexts, and then in the in the beginning of chapter three, especially verses one through seven, this is says this is who you are, and uh, in this context of marriage in specific. Mm-hmm. which again is the closest to home yeah. is the closest to home. It's in your doors. It's under your roof. It's in the bed next to you. <laughs> it's the closest to home. We have to remember to apply these things and uh, the, these, this understanding we're, we're a, we're a living stone <laughs> um, built into a spiritual house. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And we're supposed to be the spiritual household that, that can offer sacrifices pleasing to God mm. in, in this context, this context and this context. And I think that, you know, um, just even, even through teaching and having conversations with people after this message, um, that it really did, it really did set that tone to be evaluative in all things, mm-hmm. you know, and, and, and one of the things that, that I've, you know, discovered through this process or, or continue to discover and un- unveil in my life is the fact that, man, um, the ground at the foot of the cross is, will remain level the mm-hmm. whole time, right? Mm-hmm. That, that as much as I can seek to understand my wife, Right. And, and to do these things, I, I will never fully. Um, and therefore, that will expose or unveil my need for Jesus that much more in my marriage for my children uh, and allow that, that that primary ministry to be so fulfilled. Mm. That ministry here, ministry in the valley, ministry in the desert will be will be much more fruitful and benefit more from that obedience and what that looks like yeah. um, than than in the reverse order. Mm. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, that's good. Yeah, that idea of um, gentleness, I find a really good litmus test for where I'm at in my faith. Because what I have realized is just over and over and over again, how easy it is to feel like I'm getting closer to Jesus while I become a harsher person. Mm. And that aspect of gentleness is such a good litmus test for how close I actually am Mm. to Christ because the closer I get to living, breathing Jesus, the actual Jesus, not the different figments of Jesus that I create, the closer I get to the real life Jesus, the gentler I become because he is so gentle with me and he is so tender and compassionate with me. It's like Jesus gets this one opportunity in Matthew to describe himself and he says, I'm, I'm gentle Mm -hmm. and I'm humble of heart. And it's like, that's the way he describes himself. And yet we've got kind of, especially as men who follow Jesus, we've got all of this like natural desire to bring machismo into it. And it's kind of like, and that's why I think we'd read this and so easily say, well, that's like a really feminine quality. Mm -hmm. Like that's not a Mm -hmm. Christian quality. That's just great for women of God. It's Mm -hmm. like, no, that's a, that's a Christian quality. And the closer I get to Jesus, the gentler I should be becoming where for many, you know, it's interesting. There's this um, study. I totally forget this guy's name right now. Uh, done by a uh, an atheist psychologist, mm. and uh, he found that the best mental hygiene he could find for a person was contemplating God. That people who contemplated God had less anxiousness, less depression, mm. all of these things. Best mental hygiene for those mm. who contemplated God, depending on their view of God. If they viewed God as harsh and judgmental they actually got worse. Mm. And if they viewed him as loving and kind and compassionate, they got better. So it's like contemplating God was the worst thing that ever happened to some of these people yeah. who viewed him mm. incorrectly. And yet the best thing that happened to those who viewed him correctly. And so I just think, man, that is such a good like litmus test for me yeah. 
am I viewing God correctly as I'm chasing after him? Because if true, I will become gentler. Mm -hmm. And that I've, I, I found as I was thinking about that idea of a quiet spirit, man, I, there are just people with a quiet spirit that you know, mm -hmm. and they just stick out to you like a sore thumb because everybody else is so anxious, so hurried, so like, what was that notification I just got? Mm -hmm. And so kind of all over the place, yeah. people who just sit with you. I mean, you've had this in counseling appointments where mm -hmm. you're just like with somebody and it almost kind of freaks them out because it's like, you kind of haven't broken eye contact with me. Yeah, You're not like looking at the clock and looking at your phone. Like it's almost like it's disconcerting how present you are. Yeah, And yet as Christ followers, this gentleness, and yet I'm also kind of unhurried, unworried, I'm not all over the place, but I'm just content to be present with God in the moment, present with people in the moment. Mm -hmm. That's very different. Yeah. Very yeah. different than yeah. I think our kind of modern experience of faith. Absolutely. Absolutely. And when we talk about, you know, um, when we talk about gentle and quiet, you know, it's, it's so easy that we can read this text and think of it in a feminine light because we just get done reading like about your beauty. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, and again, even this picture of beauty isn't only applied to women. However, if I'm honest, I've seen more pretty women than I have men in my life and, and mm -hmm. I can't help but think about my wife. But through this, I mean, through verses three and four, it, it, it talks about this outward adornment, this, this beauty. And then it says, you know, uh, the unfading beauty the unfading beauty. And again, imperishable and unfading have been themes mm -hmm. throughout this book so far. Uh, and that it uses those specific words, right? Gentle and quiet. It's, it, it, it really does make it stand out more. And, yeah. and like you said just now, like it really does make you think um, uh, of what stands out to you in this world because those people stand out more, you know? And yeah, I, I just think that th that's really, that's a good insight, you know, to, to how to apply this text to our lives and how, how to live in that. Yeah. Um, yeah, and uh, I don't know about you, but I haven't seen your inner self lately <laughs> or your spirit. Yeah. Um, and I, I think that's the interesting thing is he's asking it. He's he's really asking us to see things that are invisible, yeah, that aren't apparent. You know, that you, <laughs> your 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 spirit actually doesn't reflect light, so I can't see it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, <laughs> I see your body. I see you know the color of your clothes and mm -hmm. all these other things. And it's, you know, it's, it's no wonder that we put so much emphasis on those things that are, that are clearly seen. And yet, um, you know, we're, we're to look for that again, the gentleness and the quietness are not readily apparent outwardly. It's the, it's the spirit. Yeah. And again, God doesn't look at the outward appearance. He looks at the heart and these are of great worth in his sight. And so it's like, man, I got to train my eyes differently. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I know something we, we talk with men all the time about is, you know, you need to bounce your eyes sometimes and make sure you're, you're making good eye contact when you're, mm -hmm. when you're with a woman. And when you think about it, you know, eyes are windows to the soul. Uh, mm -hmm. What better place to to see a person mm -hmm. yeah. than through their eyes? Mm -hmm. And uh, that's what we, I don't know, there, there's, there's, a, there's a lot there. Yeah. So. Well, in the perspective of seeing someone, right, with our eyes, and, and oftentimes the gift that we, that we fail to receive is being seen by others. Yeah. And I think that this passage points to being seen by God. Yeah. So I think the fact that it says in God's sight, yeah. not our sight. Yeah. And I think that that's yeah. so important to stress because... Oftentimes, again, like I woke up this morning, washed my face. I was thinking of adorning myself, like Mike said. Like mm. we, we adorn ourselves to an extent that I don't offend you in public. Yes. <laughs> um, uh, and and was it the was it the clothes? Was it the 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 you know the premeditation of like oh my washing my face and all these things, or was it the fact that like I woke up and I I continued in my ninety days in the Word with Pastor Evan? <laughs> mm -hmm. Was that pleasing to him because that was building the character of my soul? Was that pleasing in God's sight, not just man's sight? And man, mm -hmm. that's such a huge reminder because we oftentimes um, we present ourselves uh, we, we we present ourselves to people how we want to be seen, mm -hmm. and if not, we're working on it. We're dieting. We're working out. We're doing our thing. Um, but in God's sight, you know, how are we seen? How do, how do we feel seen? And then how can we embody that and, and allow others to be seen that way too? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Huge. Yeah. Yeah. That idea we are creating an image that is going to be presented to other people. Yep. And it's about where we're investing the time, effort and energy of our life. And it's interesting. I don't, 
I don't think Peter is as concerned with like how pretty the women are that he's writing to. Yeah. I think a lot of that, you know, it harkens back to in chapter two, I want you to live such beautiful lives mm -hmm. among the pagans. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Where's that beauty going to come from? Not your investment here. Yeah. Mm -mm. And so it's not that this is evil to invest yeah. here, but if this is where, if the bulk of your time is spent in front of the mirror instead of in front of this mirror, mm -hmm. then you're missing it. Yeah. And that's where we want to spend our time is allowing where is the bulk of the investment? My, my imagination, my affection, my thoughts, what are, what is it captivated by? Mm -hmm. Cause that's the thing that's sitting at the center of my life. And if it's not God, if it's not his word, if it's not uh, his kingdom, then I'm going to find myself being adorned and presenting an image yeah. that is very different and other than what my father intends and what his kingdom is all about. Yeah. And that's Peter's whole thing, right? He wants, we, we ought to embody the kingdom. Yeah. Um, and let's talk about this a little bit as embodying that as husbands, right? We could talk about, here's the five best ways for wives to submit to their husbands, mm. but none of us are wives, right? So, <laughs> yeah. and we've talked about Pass. that enough this weekend. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about how you as husbands have learned, there's kind of two great, words in here related to wives to be considerate as you live with them and to treat them with respect. Um, those are really kind of more of a cherishing or honoring. Mm -hmm. How have you learned to do that in your marriage so that some of the fellows listening today could maybe pick up some kind of practical ways um, to be more considerate or to better cherish their wife? For me, I'm going to go back to that, uh, that inner voice, that yeah. inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, there, there are times when we can say, um, negative things about our wives in our heads mm. and we don't let it out of our mouth cause we know we, that shouldn't come out. Right. We're yep. afraid of oh, man. the, the resulting, you know, melee that might, you know, ensue. Um, and so, so sometimes you can get this negative feedback loop going in your brain about your wife and, um. I, I just have um, learned over the course of my life that um, Paul Tripp says it well, no one is more influential in your life than you are because nobody talks to you more than you do. Mm -hmm. And uh, that, that I have to correct that, that inner dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so for me, um, I, I just have to, um, I have to have this inner dialogue about my wife to myself. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That is, um, that is reverent, you know, like honoring and, you know, that, that I just see the nobility of my wife. Um, one of the things that even in my own, uh, feedback loop, uh, as we've gone through this passage, this gentle, quiet spirit, I, I, she's a teacher, um, for those of you who may not know, my wife teaches third grade, and and uh, I love the stories that she'll come back with when there's just all this volume and noise and chaos mm -hmm. in the room because she's got like 18 third grade boys in her classroom, so yeah. there's a lot of that. And how when she tries to match their volume, it it isn't very helpful, mm. but when she gets quiet, mm. it's amazing how they get quiet. And, I, and it just is just like... Man, you know, so the, in my in my inner dialogue, even about my own wife, it's just like, man, I just love her gentle and quiet spirit, mm. and I've just been reminding myself of how how much I love that, and it's amazing how that inner dialogue changes how I actually interact with her. Mm -hmm. Whereas if I've got something else stuck in there, you know, yeah. oh, she's this or she's that, and it's negative. My interactions with her are harsh, mm, disrespectful, yeah. inconsiderate, rude, um, and so yeah. For me, that it's a lot of it's that inner dialogue that I have in my own mind about my wife, and make sure making sure that I'm honoring her even in my thoughts mm, yeah, about her. Yeah. Yeah. That's really good, Mike. I, I love and appreciate that perspective. I think there's. I think a lot of people go unchecked in their marriage for how they think about their spouse, yeah. which is so incredibly important. There's mm -hmm. so much weight to how we think about uh, our spouse. And 
the way that we think about them tends to be what seeps out, right? Mm -hmm. So when you think about them in a very positive light, all of a sudden you find yourself verbalizing compliments much more easily and readily. Yep. Yeah. And in the same way, when you think about them in a negative light, you find yourself verbalizing criticism much more easily, yep. much more readily. Yeah. And um, I think it's so interesting how for both wives and husbands, Peter makes it clear how much God cares about how you think about your spouse. Yeah. He commends Sarah for how she thinks about Abraham. Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's not even what yeah. she actually verbally says to him, right. but really commends her for what she thinks about Abraham because yeah. she affirms God's design in her thinking. Mm -hmm. And in the same way, we want to be people who affirm God's design in our thinking of our wives. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. What about for you, Mike? Yeah, I just think one of the ways, uh, you know, some translations, like how Mike said, just tackling those is in the same way, be considerate as you live with your wives, um, you know, the New King James or even the New American Standard, say live with an understanding or mm. live with a knowledge of. Yeah. And over the years, you know, this year marks mine and my wife's 20th anniversary just wow. together, you know, and we're, I'm, I, I still think to myself, is this real? You know, in a huge way. <laughs> My, um, I married up, if you don't know. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but she is, um, she, you know, introduced me to Christ as a teenager. We walked in this newness of a life. Um, we were, you know, engaged and were married and still growing in this understanding of, uh, of, of getting to know her better and understanding her and knowing her. Um, for some of the people that could be listening or listen to the weekend message, it could have been the same for them, you know, where, where their, their wife was their first impression uh, of God. Right. Their mm -hmm. wife, their wife was uh, Pastor Tom spoke often when he said, you know, um, sometimes the Holy Spirit sounds a lot like my wife. <laughs> and, yeah. um, and, and and I totally I totally resonate with that. Uh, one of one of the things that that I think about as husbands, what 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 have I done in the past was that uh, I needed to make sure that my desires were aligned with God's. Mm -hmm. uh, and when I when uh, when I spoke to the, the Hesperia campus this weekend, Man, I really did. Uh, we read through one of the Psalms um, at 37, 4, when it says, you know, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. And I told the campus, not just to be sure what it doesn't say. It doesn't say come to God and he'll give you everything you want. It says to delight yourself in the Lord. So when you delight yourself in the Lord, you're getting to know him better. You're knowing his will through reading his word. You're connected to his community. You're an active part of his body. This church doesn't exist to feed you, you mm -hmm. know, uh, that, that you would be a part of it. Um, and in by doing so, uh, your desires would change as your life aligned with Christ. And as that happens, your desires would change to his desires for you. Therefore, mm. you will be given the desires of your heart. And mm. if I'm honest, in that time um, of, of most growth and in these, these last two decades now of growing alongside my wife in different seasons from, from teenage years to now raising five kids together, um, one of the disciplines that I've had to exercise on a regular basis that the way I would live with my wife in an understandable and a knowledgeable way was, was to know and recognize that she is so close to the Lord mm -hmm. and to believe the things that she says about me that I don't believe about myself. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, having, having a, a, a different background than she did, like a different household that we grew up in, totally different. Um, but to know that as we raise our kids, you know, I don't think the standard is to just do a little better than our parents, really. You know, um, and the things that she would, you know, uh, the ways that she would win me over in terms of having a gentle and quiet soul or, or introducing me to Christ when we were teenagers. Um, but how now she absolutely gives me the confidence to lead our family well. Hmm. And one of the things that I think about is knowing that, you know, it's been this long now and we're continuing to grow. I feel like I've been married to several different versions of my wife mm -hmm. <laughs> in and out of seasons. And that takes an ongoing and progressive and developing understanding of how to live with her. Mm. So applying this to, to my marriage today, man, um, I think of the garden and the original design that there's multiple ways to do this right. And I think that in and out of season, we should be seeking those. We should be seeking those as husbands. So if you're, if you're listening today and you're like, man, we've, we've, we've been together for so long, or, or how about this? Like, we're just getting to know each other. You're going to have to chase after this. Mm -hmm. uh, and the thing is, it has to come with that lens of, of how we approach our wives by being these men of God, 
understanding yeah. that our identity is in Christ. Yeah. And then this is how we ought to live. But I'm so grateful for his word because it gives us the instruction yeah. and, and, and it does really give us accountability yeah. in what it says. Yeah. Because again, when we're supposed to live with our wives with this understanding and we're supposed to treat them with respect, it's not a matter of just knowing it and not doing it. <laughs> that reminds me of the passage of James again, right after uh, the, the, you know, the be quick to listen. It says, don't merely be hearers of the words, but be doers. Mm. And uh, man, I just think it, it gives us accountability uh, and in our season of marriage and, and what we have going on, we're so grateful for the testimony God's given us yeah. um, just as a couple. Mm. Um, we do a, a lot of premarital counseling here at the church and we've done it in the past. And we're so grateful for these opportunities that God's allowed us into his design. So in his spirit, I took a little extra time in this section of the message to talk about God's design more. We went to Ephesians 5. Right. Mm-hmm. We talked about how the Apostle Paul wrote the church and said, husbands, you know, love your wives as Christ, love the church and gave himself up for. Her. And in that passage of, you know, Ephesians 5, 21 through 33, he actually quotes Genesis 2, 24, mm-hmm. when it says, therefore, a man will leave his father and mother and make his home with his wife and those two will become one flesh. And the end of that passage in Genesis caps off God's design for marriage. Mm-hmm. And it says that man and woman were in the garden naked and felt no shame Mm. and that concept like even saying that out loud right now i know our viewers are going to be like oh okay but to have a a, a clear understanding and a deep intimate knowledge and a closeness with god through his word that's such a beautiful design Mm. and and that is a a design with no with no measurable depth Mm. you know Mm. that that how close can you and your wife get well as as radiant as the picture of christ's love for his church can be you will be this in your marriage. Mm. So I think that that's one of the things that I take specifically from that section as a husband to continually pursue and learn how to live with my wife with an understanding and knowledge of her. So, yeah. Yeah. Yeah, Nobody becomes that as a husband on accident, Mm. right? Mm -hmm. It takes intentionality. And, um, you know, I kind of think Peter writing to husbands in his day, He's probably saying like, hey, fellas, let's, let's dial it back a little bit. Like, <laughs> this is a little much. I think if Peter was writing to us today, it'd be like, hey, let's, let's, let's dial, dial it up, up a little yeah, bit, yeah. you guys. Like, let's be intentional with the way that we live with our wives. Mm-hmm. Because I think the cultural understanding of a husband and a father is somebody who's just kind of along for the ride. Mm. And wife's driving the bus and like we just got to make things work and the husband's just like okay like i'm i'm here whatever you want like whatever's good for you Mm -hmm. and i'm just here and it's like man that is so far from the biblical picture i actually think there's probably when you put it in that context there's probably a lot of wives sitting in our church who are like man i i wish i wish my my husband would be because again this is not a command to be a dictator this is a command to be intentional in how you operate as a husband. And for me, that has looked like to live with a knowledge of my wife means that I have to be intentional about the questions that I ask. Mm -hmm. It's not as simple as just how was your day, but I'm trying to extract better information about what God is doing in the life of my wife so I know how to be praying for her. I'm trying to extract better information about what's really pressing in on her soul right now. What are the things that are really challenging for her? Mm -hmm. What are the things she's overjoyed about and really excited about? That's like, you know, for when you oversee somebody here at the church, our XPs expect you to just be able to kind of rattle off what's going on in their life. Mm -hmm. And it's just being a good boss. Um, You should know what's going on in the life of your wife more than just the... Um, factual details of, yeah, she goes to work on these days and this is what our calendar looks like. Like you should know what's going on in your Mm -hmm. wife's life. And that takes a lot of, like I would recommend, has worked for me, pre-written questions about digging into your your, your wife's life because you're gonna come home from work and just be beat and like not even know how to like mentally register debriefing the day with your wife have some questions that are just like go-to questions to dig cuts deeper than just how was your day. Mm -hmm. And so for me, that living with knowledge, man, that's huge. Mm -hmm. And what I've also noticed though, is that almost, I'd probably be hard pressed to find a marriage conflict that was not rooted in me not cherishing my wife. Yeah, Mm -hmm. I think most of those conflicts come from the fact of not that I failed in this area or this area or this area, 
but really that she did not feel like she had my attention readily available and my affection readily available. I was not interruptible to my wife. Mm -hmm. And that idea of intimacy should bring more interruptibility. The more intimate that you get with somebody, the more interruptible you should be, which is a great parallel for prayer, but that's a different sermon for a different day. But I think that um, the relationship we have with our wives, we should be so interruptible to them, so available and yeah, she's wanting to talk about how you were hurtful in this area or that area or that area. But if you're available in that moment, that's it. The conflict's like over. Yeah. It's dealt with because you were available to talk about it. It's when you won't emotionally get there or you come in with defensiveness or you're like, I can't do this right now. I need to go do X or I can't pick up your call because I'm working or what, whatever yeah. is taking priority. When there is that feeling that your wife is not your priority, that that's a big deal. Yeah. And that cuts against this teaching. Out of all human relationships, our wives are our number one and most important priority mm-hmm. over our kids, over our workplace, mm-hmm. over fill in the blank. It is always It always needs to be our wives. And if it's not, I think that's where we get into a lot of the spaces of conflict. Yeah. Um, any final thoughts as we wrap up? I think we lied to the people that we were going to be short. Yeah, yeah that's very true. <laughs> that's on us. <laughs> Great notes for your husband, so. Yeah, yeah there it is. Um, uh, well, thank you guys for taking the time. Yeah. It was fun yeah. getting to teach this with you guys this weekend yeah. and go through the process. Likewise. Yeah, yeah absolutely. We appreciated it. All right. Well, that's what we have for this week here on Tangible Takeaways. I hope it's been helpful and uh, enjoyable for you. If you got something that you're taking away from the message this weekend, please let us know there in the comments. As always, don't forget to like the video and subscribe. Maybe share it with a friend uh, if you found it helpful. That's all we have for this week. And uh, we'll catch you guys next time on Tangible Takeaways.